Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, the White Army, for giving me an excellent opportunity to give a talk on localization in neurology. This is Dr. Srinivas, neurologist from Rajmundi, Andhra Pradesh. I would also like to thank my postgraduate students, Dr. Nitish and Dr. Soumya, who are with me to take on your questions in the chat box and be with me for answering those questions. Yeah, special thanks to Dr. Kishan Rao, who has been instrumental in uh, making this session possible. The White Army help others to help ourselves of excellent uh, slogan. I'm also the medical author of the book, Focused Neurology. Uh, entire neurology I put in a question and answer format, which is available online from all leading bookshops, including Amazon. If interested, you can buy it. Yeah, today I'm going to really give a gist of the localization of neurology. But if you are interested to get more details, you can get back to my own YouTube channel, Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts, where I have nearly 8,000 subscribers and uh, Yeah, localization in clinical neurology. My email is cklpm at gmail.com. Right. I, I just need about an hour or so of your patient, patience and attention. I'm really going to give a, a good overview of localization in clinical neurology. And I believe it will be very useful for uh, MBBS students final year for taking up MD, MD uh, general medicine exam and MD postgraduate students who are appearing for general medicine and maybe a, a fast refresher course for DM neurology students. So localization in clinical neurology, we'll go step by step. We'll start with the lobes, then come to thalamus, cranial nerves, peripheral nerve, neuromuscular junction, and muscle. Here we go. Localization in clinical neurology, the frontal lobe. What are the functions of the frontal lobe? The functions of the frontal lobe are emotional restraint, judgment, reasoning, memory, and abstract thinking. And the dysfunction of the frontal lobe are social disinhibition, poor judgment, silly behavior, lack of memory. In fact, the immediate memory goes to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So dementia, especially normal pressure hydrocephalus, where they have prior of dementia, uh, gait apraxia and bladder disturbances and impairment of abstract thinking. The frontal lobe also has got the precentral gyrus, which is very, very important because it is from this area, the corticospinal tract begins and goes to the anterior hansel of the spinal cord, what we call it as an upper motor neuron. So if this motor cortex gets affected, patient will develop weakness on the contralateral side. So the frontal lobe, especially the precentral gyrus gets affected, patient will develop hemiparesis on the opposite side. Why on the opposite side? Because the corticospinal tract descends from the motor cortex and crosses at the level of the medulla oblongata to go to the opposite side. And therefore, the right frontal lesions will produce left hemiplegia and left frontal lesions will produce right hemiplegia. We also have another important area, the Broca's area in the frontal lobe. The Broca area is responsible for fluency of the speech, the language. Normally, we speak about 100 to 110 words per minute. If it's reduced below 10 words per minute, we call it as a non-fluent speech. So the Broca's area is in the frontal lobe, and if the Broca's area gets affected, patient will have the non-fluent speech, which is known as Broca's aphasia. This is seen on the dominant cortex. What is dominant cortex? The right-handers, more than right hand, more than 90% of the right-handers, the speech or the language areas are situated on the left side of the cortex, which we call it as a dominant cortex, where the language areas are situated. So the right-handers, more than 90% of the time, the language areas are situated on the left side, we call that as a dominant cortex. So the dominant cortex, that is left side, of the cortex gets affected, Broca's area, patient will have non-fluent aphasia along with hemiplegia. But then, though most of the components of language are on the dominant cortex, one component is there on the non-dominant cortex, what we call as 
prosody that is the intonation i'll give you an example if you meet your friend after 10 years who's come from the us you feel excited you say oh my friend how are you you have lot of inflections and melody but if that is absent and if it's a flat tone you call that as lack of prosody for example god forbid if the non dominant cortex or the frontal lobe gets affected you just address your friend oh oh my friend you have come from us after 10 years how are you it's a flat tone so almost all the components of the language are there in the not in the dominant cortex except one component that is prosody or the melody or the intonation which is there on the non dominant cortex you have another important area in the frontal lobe which is known as frontal ipils area number 8 the frontal ipils area number 8 tends to push the eyes to the opposite side it is known as saccadic pathway saccades so frontal ipils area number 8 for example on the left side goes and connects to the ppr paramedian pontine reticular formation in the pons on the right side which tends to push the eyes towards the right side so the left front light field area number 8 is stimulated the eyes will move towards the right side and therefore if the left front light field area number 8 is affected if there is an infarct patient cannot move the eyes to the opposite side patient's eye will be towards the same side and hemiplegia will be on the opposite side because the corticospinal tract crosses at the level of the medial oblique and goes to the opposite side so eye is looking to one side and hemiplegia on the opposite side it's a frontal lobe infarct especially in the front light field area number 8 is affected whereas if it is a pontine lesion the frontal light field area number 8 the saccadic pathway comes and crosses and goes to the opposite side in the pprf pprf in the pons has got a tendency to pull the eyes towards its across the level of the medial oblique and goes to the opposite So eyes looking towards the hemiplegia is a frontal lesion. Eyes looking to one side and hemiplegia on the opposite side is a frontal lobe lesion, especially in the front light field area number eight is affected. Yeah, these are all the important functions of the frontal lobe. Now let's go to the parietal lobe. As frontal lobe is important for all the movements for the motor power, the parietal lobe is important for the sensations. So up to thalamus all. all our primary sensations go like touch pain temperature position joint and vibration sense but from thalamus what goes to the parietal cortex these are known as the cortical sensations so the parietal cortex gets affected the primary sensations may be intact but the cortical sensations would be lost so what are the cortical sensations loss of tactile localization they cannot precisely say where the hand has been touched two point discrimination when the two points are placed on the skin and the two points are appreciated as a separate point we call that as a two point discrimination the nearest the closest place where the two points are appreciated as the two distinct points the two point discrimination is present and very highly sensitive in the lips and fingertips because the fingers and the face area has got the highest representation in the sensory homonuclus and therefore the two point discrimination is well appreciated in the lips and fingertips and least appreciated on the on the back of the trunk then stereognosis we place something like keychain or something in the hand and closing his eye ask him to feel and tell what it is if he is not able to tell it that means his stereognosis is affected again it's a parietal lobe function graphesthesia we write numbers like 4 or 6 on the hand and ask him to appreciate it if he is not able to appreciate it by closing his eyes then we say it as agraphesthesia so if the parietal lobe gets affected the cortical sensation is lost in the loss of tactile localization two point discrimination stereognosis and graphesthesia we have the is also going the optic radiation for parietal lobe the representation is on the opposite side so the parietal lobe gets affected they'll be having so because the parietal lobe the visual radiation and we have homonymous hemianopia especially the interval functions of the dominant cortex of the parietal lobe is apraxia inability to perform a learned motor act despite motor sensory comprehension and coordination being normal basically we have two types of apraxia idiomotor apraxia or ideational apraxia 
if it's a non if it's a dominant cortex getting affected in idiomotor apraxia the parietofrontal connections get affected but frontal lobe is intact per se and therefore patients when they are asked to imagine and then perform an act they cannot but when they are given a real lifetime object they are able to perform it so since when given a real lifetime object they are able to perform activities of daily living are not impaired in idiomotor apraxia and which is very common apraxia in ideational apraxia the frontal lobe per se is affected and therefore even when given a real lifetime object they cannot perform uh, an act with a real lifetime object in a sequential manner they go out of sequence for example if you ask them to brush the teeth they may take the brush and start brushing the teeth and then they take and then they may put the paste so they go out of sequence so activities of daily living are impaired in ideational apraxia so idiomotor apraxia and ideational apraxia are very common in the if the dominant parietal cortex gets affected if the non dominant parietal lobe gets affected we have another two apraxias which are known as constructional apraxia or dressing apraxia they are more to do with the spatial orientation constructional apraxia ask them to draw a cube they cannot ask them to put on a dress they'll find it very difficult to put on the dress dressing apraxia then they can have left hemi neglect if the non dominant parietal cortex gets affected they'll have left hemi neglect because the non dominant cortex controls both the right and the left extra personal space whereas the dominant cortex left parietal cortex controls only the right extra personal space so if the left parietal cortex gets affected the right visual field is affected but this is compensated by the intact right parietal lobe which controls both the right and the left and therefore left parietal lobe or a dominant cortex usually does not produce right hemi neglect whereas if the right parietal lobe gets affected both the right and the left extra personal space is affected the right extra personal space is, is compensated by the intact left parietal lobe but there's no compensation on the left side and therefore right parietal lobe or the non dominant cortex develops left hemi neglect how do we test it at the bed side we ask we ask them to draw a circle uh, like a like a clock and put all the 12 numbers equally spaced they'll put all the 12 numbers on one side and they'll completely neglect the left side of the clock so this is how we make out the left hemi neglect if the hemi neglect is so so much here they may even deny the existence of the left side of the body patients deny owning their own contralateral lens which is known as anosognosia so these are all the important functions of the non dominant cortex temporal lobe so so far we've seen the frontal lobe and parietal lobe now let's see the temporal lobe memory memory is very very important as far as the temporal lobe is concerned the immediate memory goes to the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex but the other two memories the recent memory goes to the hippocampus which is otherwise known as episodic memory and the long term memory or the remote memory semantic memory goes to the lateral temporal cortex so if temporal lobe gets affected memory gets affected in fact uh, herpes simplex encephalitis where temporal lobe gets affected they will have loss of memory hippocampus so the recent memory how do you check you give three unrelated articles ask him to repeat after 10 minutes if he is not able to repeat it that means his hippocampus affected the recent memory is affected another very interesting uh, part of memory is the memory of fear memory of fear is present in amygdala so as long as amygdala is intact patients will have a uh, person will have a memory of fear kluver and duse have done a wonderful experiment wherein they removed the amygdala of the monkeys so generally monkeys are hostile to snakes but when they have removed amygdala what they found is that monkeys became very friendly with snakes and started playing with snakes and taking snakes and putting around their neck and playing this goes to show that the moment amygdala is removed the memory of fear is removed and inhibition is removed so this is known as kluver duse syndrome elegantly demonstrated by kluver duse about the importance of amygdala in terms of memory of fear and all the emotions goes to the limbic lobe so if the person's uh, temporal lobe gets affected they have emotional disturbances as broca's area is a part of the frontal lobe wernick's area is a part of the temporal lobe wernick's area is responsible for understanding or comprehension so a person has got wernick's area being affected in the temporal lobe patient cannot understand but he speaks on but he speaks continuously fluent but nonsense speech without understanding what has been told to him so this is known as wernick's aphasia a fluent but nonsense speech and these persons with wernick's aphasia usually will not have hemiplegia 
because the corticospinal tract does not go through the temporal lobe. Unlike Broca's aphasia, who will have any plesia because the corticospinal tract goes through the frontal lobe. So, Wernicke's area gets affected, comprehension gets affected, they'll have Wernicke's aphasia without hemiplegia. And then the optic radiations get affected. So, they'll have homonymous hemianopia, but this time it is a superior quadrantonopia. Now, finally, the last lobe is the occipital lobe. Occipital lobe is concerned with the perception of vision. They give meaning to what the eyes have seen. So, the occipital lobe gets affected, they'll have all problems of the vision. So, Oxford lobe, they'll have visual, hemi, visual field defects, they'll have homonymous hemianopia, but this time with macular sparing, the center of the vision is spared because there are two theories. One, the macula is separated by not only the posterior cerebral artery, but also the middle cerebral artery. Second, the macula has got a wide representation. So they'll have homonymous hemianopia with mas macular sparing. Two other fascinating concepts are the occipital temporal connections being involved and occipital parietal connections being involved. If occipital temporal connections are involved, what of vision is affected? They cannot make out what it is. What of vision is affected? Classic example is prosopagnosia. They'll be seeing faces, but they cannot give meaning to what they see. Inability to identify known faces is prosopagnosia. So if occipital temporal connections are affected, they'll have what of vision being affected. Whereas if occipital parietal connections get affected, they'll have wear of vision being affected. That is, they're not able to integrate the center of the vision with the periphery of the vision. This is known as acymaltagnosia. For example, if they look at the forest, they'll be not looking at the forest in its entirety. They'll be only focusing on one particular tree in the entire forest. They cannot integrate the center of the vision with the periphery of the vision. They'll miss the forest for the tree. This is acymaltagnosia, very characteristically seen in occipitoparietal connections, resulting in balance syndrome, where they have not only acymal tenognosia, but optic ataxia and oculomotor apraxia. Yeah, these are all the important concepts of the lobes. The frontal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe and occipital lobe. Now let's see the internal capsule. What are all the important concepts of the internal capsule? Internal capsule basically has got first four parts. One is the anterior limb. Second is the genu. Third is the posterior limb. And and below and behind it is known as retro and sublenticular part of the internal capsule. For all practical purposes, be it MBBS, MD or DM, even for practice purposes, of all these four parts, the posterior limb is very, very important because if the posterior limb of the internal capsule gets affected, the corticospinal fibers gets affected, thalamic radiations get affected. So they'll have hemiplegia and hemisthesia. I repeat, of all the structures, the posterior limb of the internal capsule is very, very important because if the posterior limb gets affected, the corticospinal fibers are densely packed in the posterior limb, the thalamic radiations are densely packed in the posterior limb, and therefore, when the posterior limb of the internal capsule gets affected, they'll have hemiplegia and hemisthesia. In genu, they'll have corticobulbar fibers, so more of face gets affected if the genu is affected. Whereas the anterior limb, it contains the frontoconto-cerebellar fibers and therefore they can have sometimes manifestations of cerebellar, cerebellar in involvement because most of the afferent connections to the cerebellum comes from the frontal lobe to the pons. In fact, the pons is densely packed with the afferent fibers to the cerebellum. So the anterior limb gets affected, they'll have frontoconto-cerebellar dysfunction and page circuit. Page circuit is very, very important in terms of memory. They also pass to the anterior limb and saccadic pathway, as I said earlier in my lecture, the front life fields area number eight, it goes and connects to the PPRF on the opposite side, where it is responsible for pushing the eyes to the opposite side. So the anterior limb of the internal capsule gets affected. They'll have frontoponto cerebellar dysfunction. They'll have paper circuit being involved, memory being affected, and saccadic pathway getting affected. Whereas if genu gets affected, the corticobulbar fibers getting, gets affected. And face more often gets affected. Whereas the posterior limb, very, very important because in this area, only all our corticospinal and thalamic radiations are present. So the posterior limb gets affected, they'll have dense hemiplegia, they will have the sensations being affected. And if the retro and sublenticular parts of the internal capsule gets affected, we have the visual and auditory radiation going uh, in these areas and therefore they'll have problems with the vision and, and uh, auditory pathways. So if if this area, especially the posterior limb gets affected, they'll have hemiplegia, 
hemisthesia and homonymous hemianopia, very characteristic uh, of the posterior limb of the internal capsule if it gets affected. Yeah. Next, we'll go to the thalamus. Thalamus has got uh, about four important uh, nuclei structures. They have the anterior nuclei, they have the dorsal nuclei, they have the ventral nuclei, and then they have the ventrolateral nuclei. In the anterior nuclei, they have the mammillary body and singlet gyrus, which is responsible for the limbic system, the emotions. So they go towards the temporal lobe and therefore they're responsible for emotions, the limbic system. Then we have the dorsal nuclei, that is the lateral posterior nuclei and the pulvinar and the extra genicloacalcrine vision, which goes towards the occipital lobe and therefore they'll have problems with the vision, especially they may have blind sight. A completely blind person will still be able to crudely localize and respond to visual stimuli being affected. And then we have the ventral nuclei, uh, where we have the ventral posterior lateral, ventral posterior median, that is the spinothalamic tract, and the posterior column goes there. And therefore, they are primarily responsible for sensations. And if it gets affected, there will be sensory loss, and they can have the thalamic pain also. The ventrolateral nuclei, the motor activity goes through it, through to basal ganglia and cerebellum. So they can also produce the motor involvement. So if the thalamus gets affected, depending on the nuclei which gets affected, they can have the emotions being affected, they can have vision being affected, they can have sensations being affected, they can have the motor part being affected. Hypothalamus. Hypothalamus, the function is basically appetite, thirst, osmolality, temperature, and sexual functions. And therefore, the dysfunction of the hypothalamus will result in hyperphagia, Dietus insipidus, SIADH, sexual and temperature dysregulation. Basal ganglia. Basal ganglia, basically the three important structures are the substantia nigra, the caudate nucleus, and subthalamus. So substantia nigra gets affected. They'll have hypokinesia, a decrease in movement. A movement disorder can be approached as two important uh, uh, presentation. One, a decrease in movement known as hypokinesia. Second, an increase in movement known as hyperkinesia. So if substantia nigra gets affected, they'll have hypokinesia. The classic example is Parkinson's disease. If caudate nucleus gets affected, they'll have hyperkinesia. Classic example is chorea. If subthalamus gets affected, they'll have hemibalismus. Midbrain. The horizontal gaze, if we move eyes to right side or left side, the horizontal gaze, the center is in the pons. If we want to move eyes up and down, the center is in the midbrain. So if midbrain gets affected, the up and down eye movement gets affected, the vertical gaze gets affected, the pons gets affected, the right and left-sided movement gets affected, the horizontal gaze gets affected. So if midbrain, midbrain gets affected, the vertical gaze, the up and down movement gets affected. So there will be impairment of upward, upward gaze. The classic example is Parinaut syndrome, where they will not be able to look upwards, they will be only looking downwards. And we have two important cranial nerves coming up in the midbrain, the third and fourth cranial nerve. So they'll have ipsilateral third and fourth cranial nerve palsy. We have the corticospinal tracts running in the midbrain, so they'll have contralateral hemiplegia. The substantia nigra is also present in the midbrain, so they'll develop Parkinson's disease. So the important structure and functions are the vertical gaze being affected, the classic example perinaut, the third, fourth cranial nerves getting affected, the corticospinal tract getting affected, producing contralateral hemiplegia. Substantia nigra getting affected, producing Parkinson's disease. These are all the important concepts of midbrain. Now let's check out on the pons. As vertical gaze, the center is the midbrain. The center for horizontal gaze is the PPRF, paramedian pontine reticular formation. So if the horizontal pons gets affected, the horizontal gaze gets affected, they'll have horizontal gaze palsy. Very important uh, concept here is that locked in syndrome, wherein there's an infarction in the pons. So the pawns gets affected, they cannot move eyes towards the right or the left, the horizontal gets, gaze gets affected. Since the corticospinal tract, corticobulbar tracts uh, go through the pawns, they'll have the upper limbs and the lower limbs being affected. So they are totally locked. They cannot move the upper limbs, they cannot move the lower limbs, they cannot move eyes horizontally. The only movement left is the vertical eye movement because the midbrain is intact. This is known as locked in syndrome. So in pawns, the horizontal gaze gets affected, they'll have horizontal gaze palsy. The sixth and seventh nerves goes to the pons, so they'll have ipsilateral sixth and seventh cranial nerve palsy. The corticospinal tract gets affected, so they'll have contralateral hemiplegia. Medulla oblongata. Medulla oblongata, we classically divide it into 
two parts one the medial medulla second is the lateral medulla the, there are only three important structures in the medial part of the medulla the posterior column the 12th cranial nerve and the corticospinal tract so if the medial part of the medulla gets affected the posterior column gets affected so they'll have anesthesia the 12th nerve gets affected so they'll have 12th nerve palsy the corticospinal tract gets affected they'll have hemiplegia whereas in the lateral part of the medulla we have the spinal tract of the 5th nerve spinal thalamic tract vestibular nuclei inferior cerebellar peduncle and sympathetic tracts so if the lateral part of the medulla gets affected the classic example is wallenberg syndrome we have the ipsilateral facial sensory loss with contralateral body loss of pain and temperature vertigo and honus syndrome kindly note that in lateral medullary syndrome or wallenberg syndrome there is no hemiplegia hemiplegia is not present in wallenberg syndrome or lateral medullary syndrome because the corticospinal tract is present in the medial part of the medulla uh, which only causes hemiplegia but in wallenberg syndrome the lateral part of the medulla is affected and therefore the corticospinal tract which is medially placed is spared and there is no hemiplegia in the lateral medullary syndrome or wallenberg syndrome cerebellum cerebellum there are three important structures the floccular nodular lobe which is known as archicellum archicerebellum which is the oldest then the vermis paleo cerebellum which is of the recent origin medieval cerebellar hemisphere which is the latest inclusion neo cerebellum the most recent part the floccular nodular node or the archi cerebellum which is the oldest part of the cerebellum it is concerned with the eye movement control and gross orientation in space you can remember it better when you remember fish so fish is also concerned with the eye movement and balance so floccular nodular lobe is responsible and concerned with the eye movement control and gross orientation in space like fish vermis or the paleo cerebellum is concerned with gait and locomotion like snake the cerebellar hemisphere is concerned with the precise movements of the extremities like monkey so floccular nodular lobe is concerned with eye movements like fish the vermis is concerned with locomotion and gait like snake the cerebellar hemispheres are concerned with the precise movement of the extremities like monkey spinal cord when the spinal cord gets affected we have about six characteristic uh, diseases being present one syringomyelia where the center of the spinal cord gets affected the spinothalamic tract is the only tract which traverses through the spinal cord and then ascends to the opposite side and therefore when the center part of the spinal cord gets affected it is only the spinothalamic tract gets which gets affected not the posterior column or peripheral tract which do not cross at the level of the spinal cord but cross at the level of the medulla oblongata so if there is any cavity or the center of the spinal cord gets affected it is only the spinothalamic tract getting gets affected the spinothalamic tract carries pain and temperature sensations posterior column carries touch position joint vibration sensation so here is a very interesting case where there's a center of the spinal cord getting affected causing syringomyelia causing dissociated sensory loss association means coming together dissociation means going away so in dissociated sensory loss pain is lost but touch is present very interesting if a person is touch is able to appreciate but if the person keeps his hand in the fire he is not able to appreciate the pain so this is known as dissociated sensory loss pain is affected but touch is spared if the entire spinal cord is cut off we call that as transverse myelitis so all the tracts below the spinal cord gets affected so motor sensory and sphincter dysfunction below the lesion is seen brown sec quad syndrome is known as hemi section of the spinal cord perhaps of the trauma where only half of the spinal cord is cut so in the half of the spinal cord is cut the posterior column and peripheral tract have already crossed at the level of the medulla oblongata and descending and therefore there will be ipsilateral posterior column and corticospinal tract getting affected whereas the spinothalamic tract crosses immediately to the opposite side and ascends and therefore if there is a hemi cord hemi section of the cord same side ipsilateral posterior column and corticospinal tract are affected but the manifestations of the spinothalamic tract is on the opposite side this is known as brown sec quad syndrome anterior spinal artery anterior spinal artery supplies the corticospinal tract and spinothalamic tract but the posterior column which is which is placed posteriorly is supplied by the posterior spinal artery and therefore when there is an anterior spinal artery syndrome the corticospinal tract and spinothalamic tract are affected but the posterior column which is supplied by the posterior spinal artery is spared so posterior column is spared whereas if it is a posterior spinal artery only the posterior column is affected then we have another interesting disease known as subacute combined 
degeneration, which is because of vitamin B12 deficiency. Vitamin B12 is responsible for myelination. The corticospinal tract, pyramidal tract, and the large peripheral fibers are well myelinated. Spinothalamic tract and small fibers are least myelinated. And therefore, when there is vitamin B12 deficiency, there are well myelinated tracts get affected, like corticospinal tract and posterior column, and the large peripheral fibers, whereas the spinothalamic tract and small fibers are not affected. So these are the important concepts of spinal cord and the localization. Now we shall go to the cranial nerves. We have 12 pairs of cranial nerves. First is the olfactory. When the olfactory nerve is responsible for smell and when the olfactory nerve gets affected, patient will have anosmia, loss of smell. One of the common cause of anosmia is head injury, where the olfactory filaments get stoned. Uh, and olfactory group meningioma. Optic. Optic nerve is... Thank you. 